Okay, so we looked at this last lecture. We said that this idea of shear center is super important for wing design. And we said that it's not simply a matter of making sure that a wing is stiff enough to make sure that it can withstand any torsional loads being applied. We've got to understand how those loads are propagated through the structure such that its shear center makes it possible that the moment that's applied by the wing isn't large enough to overcome whatever stiffness it has. I sort of described that in a roundabout fashion, but I think I described it pretty well with the example of the Fokker D8. So you can have a wing that's tremendously stiff. You can make your wing stiffer, but you can move the torsional center or the flexural axis, thereby moving that elastic axis aft, and that can then increase the coupling between lift and moment, sorry, not lift and moment, um, it would increase the lift and moment, but what I'm trying to say is that it would increase the coupling between lift and torsional deflection. So let's have a think about how we're going to go any further with this. Um, I'm going to introduce something today called shear flow, because we, we obviously need to understand how we determine shear center, and we're going to do that for thin-walled sections, or thin-walled structures, using something called shear flow. So let's just remind ourselves what the shear center means. This is the point within a two-dimensional section at which, if we apply a point load, only a bending results and no torsion. So the corollary of this is that if we load at any point that's not the shear center, we'll experience a, a twist, a torsion to the section as well. Okay, so at any point a torsional deflection will occur. So we're not necessarily trying to make sure that our elastic axis is on the same um, as it is at the aerodynamic center, but we want to make sure that we keep the distance between the two knowable and such that we can have the wing to be stiff enough. So this idea of shear center, um, we'll talk a little bit more about it. If we, have, if we have a completely closed section, let's say we have a section comprising four thin walls okay so these are four thin walls i've got a rectangular section it's not filled it's got a void in the center the shear center for this must be within inside the section because it's a closed section So for a closed section, the shear center will always lie within the section, okay? Um, barring any complex geometry, sometimes we, can have a, sometimes we can have a shear center outside of it if we've got high curvature, but for the purposes we're looking at, a closed section will always have the shear center within the section. So when we draw sections like this, we're drawing thin walls. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about why I'm going to use these sorts of diagrams. But when you look at any books like Megson, etc., when we draw diagrams like this, we're looking at thin walled structures, not a solid element. We can also say that for an object with two axes of symmetry, then the centroid is identical to the torsional center. Okay, so if the, we have two axes of symmetry, then we know that the centroid lies at the intersection of those two axes of symmetry um, and is also then for the shear center. So if we have a rectangular section or comprising elements of rectangles, I'm um, sorry, no, sorry, comprising, what are we talking about? If I've, got, if I've got four walls making up a structure, so this is then a rectangular box with thin walls, then I've got two axes of symmetry. So in the very centre is both the centroid and the shear centre. So if this were the cross section through a beam, for example, then my beam would be made up of solid members of small thickness and if I were to apply a load directly at the center then only bending would occur no torsion now obviously for this section that I've drawn here this is then hollow in the section so how can we apply a load at that center and this is where we come into the idea that it's actually it's a theoretical construct to help us understand how things move in torsion we're not going to start applying point loads and working out how things are moving but for an aerofoil for example an aerofoil might have a wing box taking the large proportion of the um, well taking all of those structural loads and we want to know where it's where its shear center is um, if it's a rectangle again the shear center would be about here in the center in the centroid now we obviously can't physically load something at this point but we know from, well, you will remember from 312 and from your other aer aerospace courses that we have some sort of pressure distribution acting on the wing. Um, we can refer this back to the aerodynamic center, which is the point at which a point load plus a moment could be applied. And that can be somewhere within the section itself. So you guys can remember how to do those. And when we say loading at that point, we're not necessarily talking about hanging masses off of an aircraft. We're just saying that's where the line of action of our force is coming. So right here, that's why this is still pertinent, even though we can't necessarily load up at the middle of those sections. Okay, so that's probably a good... Again, let, let's have a look at this section here. So just to talk more about the significance of why we're looking at this. Um, in fact, I'm just going to go back up here first. I'm a little bit over, over the place with this one because this lecture is a, this lecture is a new one for me. Um, but we said here, if an object has two axes of symmetry, then the centroid is the shear center and is then the intersection of those two axes of symmetry. If the object has one axis of symmetry, then the shear center lies somewhere along that axis of symmetry. So in the example that we did up here, or the one that I just showed this example here, if the thickness 
of all of these walls was T. Then this object has two axes of symmetry. If, however, I've got a similar looking rectangular section, this is T, this one is also T, this one's also T, but this bottom one could be 3T, for example. We've then only got a single axis of symmetry in this body now because we've no longer got vertical symmetry. We've only got this single axis for symmetry. So we then know that the shear center of this object lies somewhere along here, but we don't yet know how to determine that. So where is it? It's somewhere up and down here. The shear center will lie somewhere on this vertical axis of symmetry. Now, looking at these sections that are made up of boxes with thin walls, we sometimes, as wannabe aerospace engineers, will think, hey, why are we looking at this stuff? Because it doesn't seem that important. This seems more like what a box designer might want to look at. But this stuff is pertinent. So let's, um, it is pertinent and it does have relevance to what we're looking at. So let's just consider a, a, an example wing structure. We know the substructures and their form and function that make up the wing now. We've got the spar that takes the bulk, well, takes all of the bending load effectively. We've got the ribs that help maintain the external shape, and we've got the skin that takes those aerodynamic, aerodynamic forces, transfers them to the ribs, transfers them to the spars. So let's just take that knowledge now and think about how that's going to help us. Okay, so that's my tapered wing. Let's take a cross section through it. We might have, say, two spars in this wing. I have the ribs, for example. And then all over the top and bottom, we'd have the stressed skin. Okay, so if we take a look at how these structures work, remember that the spars are often shaped like I-beams or some form of web and flange based structure. The ribs are joining them together at different parts and then the stressed skin is taking that load. So if we were to take a proper cross section through here, let's say take a slice through here and look at what that cross section might look like. Then we see the outline, again, made up by the skin. Uh, we could see the web and the flanges of two spars. We might not have a section with a rib in it, so we've just got the skin and the spars here. You know, in a, in a, generally in an aircraft, you've got a bunch of other guff going on in here, so you might see some uh, hydraulics for leading edge um, high lift devices. Same in here, for example, and you might have fuel tank in the center. The only bits we care about for structural consideration because the hydraulics don't help us, neither does the fuel tank, the bit that we care about for bearing this load and thereby working out how the structure is going to deform under applied stresses is this external structure, the external structure and the two um, webs of the spar. So let's 
being consistent with my color scheme and draw this on here. We've then got, that's not a particularly great color on this background, I don't think, so let's just swap this over. Let's say the load bearing structure is a thin walled structure like this. Okay, let's just join this back here. So we've got this thin walled section that makes up the cross section through our wing. And if we take different cross sections, we'll get slightly different shapes. Some of them might have the spar in. That just changed very much. Some of them might have the ribs in. That would just change the thickness of the upper and lower surfaces of this, of this section. So if we can understand how or determine where the shear center is of a thin walled section, then we can determine how a wing will react when a torsional load is applied. So said here, if we can understand the behavior under torsion in thin wall structures, we can understand the first order structural behavior of our wing. So I say first order, meaning that we can just determine the real basic stuff of what's the deformation under an applied torsion or load. Um, and importantly, the bit that we're gonna really be looking at is understanding where the shear center is or the flexural axis, the elastic axis of our wing. Um, so let's, Put a beam out. Okay, so if we have a restrained cantilever beam to which we apply some sort of torque, that's in beam theory, it's standard to give the torque symbol T annoyingly, but we're going to use that here. Let's say this beam is of length L. This will cause the, some sort of torsion to occur. So let's say we've got this torsional displacement. This is a really hard one to draw. Yeah, I can't. I can never draw this one. But we've applied the torsion. We've then got some sort of torsional deflection. Um, let's give that the symbol theta. Then theta is going to be governed by, it's going to be a function of the torque that we apply, the length, because that makes sense. It gives us a greater distance of deflection because the torsion is going to be low at the root and it will be maximum at the tip. It will be nothing at the root, maximum, maximum at the tip. But then the deflection is equal to the applied torque multiplied by the length divided by the torsion constant and the shear modulus. Okay, so hopefully... These are things you've maybe seen before in beam theory. We're not actually going to use this, this equation directly. I don't necessarily, I don't think we're going to get to it, but I want you to have an appreciation of what we're looking at. So let's just go through here. Applied torque, beam length. We might use this when we, if we can develop a wing bending problem. 
reason why this is kind of difficult to, to actually use as an equation is because this j is not particularly easy to calculate. The j is the torsional constant. It's equal to the polar moment of inertia only for circular or other axisymmetric structures. Um, to complicate, there's, there's no easy way to calculate what j is for, for even quite simple structures. Um, so we'll have a look at, see if we can do some of this with beam elements, but I might just end up giving you j for different sections. Axisymmetric, that just means radially symmetric. I'm not sure if you guys have used that phrase before yet. Okay, so how and why, well, we've gone through a lot of things here. Let's just have a quick recap. So we said why we want to understand shear center. So we know why we want to understand shear center, because it's going to be important to us, because it's going to determine how our wing's going to deform under some sort of applied torsional load. Um, wing is effectively... A thin wall structure so it follows for us that we want to know how we can look for the shear center of thin walled, thin walled objects and we might get to this bit as well you we might get to here to be able to understand actually what the deflectional characteristics are of a of an object sorry of a of a, of a, a wing section for example under an applied torque so if, if we wanted to determine those we'd need to be able to calculate j of the structure g is just a function of material properties the shear modulus beam length, this would be however many elements we want to split our wing up into, and apply torque, that's just for our purposes, the applied pitching moment on our, on our wing. Okay, so how are we going to determine anything relating to shear centre for our sections? So let's make a new slide. So we're going to introduce something called shear flow to help us develop means to calculate the shear center of thin walled sections. We're going to develop it for, in general form, this idea of what shear flow is. And then I'm going to present you with some simple, simple equations, simple-ish equations, um, that can help us determine the actual shear flow distribution within different thin walled structures. So we're going to look um, in the first instance at a simply supported beam and then understand what the actual shear or the distribution of shear force is there and that's going to help us. Shear flow is also used in solid mechanics quite a bit to determine, for example, how many nails you might need to hold two pieces of wood together. Okay, it helps you determine the distribution of shear stress and it is effectively a, it's a measure of the shear stress distribution within a given solid structure. It's called shear flow um, because it's really a measure of how internal forces are dissipated and propagated within a structure. But flow gives the or the word flow gives the indication that something's moving. Where well, nothing's really moving with this, it's just this distribution of shear stresses. So we're going to consider a simply supported beam with uniformly distributed load. 
let's say this beam is of length L because I'm imaginative. Okay, so if we've got this sort of beam then from 200, 202, you should be comfortable with drawing a shear force in bending moment diagrams. So bending moment is going to be, well, it's going to be zero at the two ends, and it's going to be maximum in the center. And then the shear force is going to be the first derivative of the bending moment diagram. And it's going to look something like this. Okay, so I'm just putting these up as things you guys should be able to do. Again, these are terrible diagrams. I haven't got any axis labels on these. I'm just recapping the things that I would expect you guys to be able to do. So if we were to look at this beam now and take a slice through it, then what we what's going to be interesting to us is look at the distribution of the shear stress within the beam. So let's take a slice through here. Our slice is up here with that wonderful arrowhead that I just drew. Okay, so we're going to have a look at this section. We're going to take a cut through and we're going to remember that we've actually got a 3D beam here. We're going to say we've got a three-dimensional beam. So I've now cut this. This is now looking at my slice through the beam. So this is my Y. This is the direction we never saw before, which is Z, and then X would be the direction along the axis of the beam. Let's just check, is that right-handed? Yep, it's right-handed, thankfully. So then this would be the axis system. Beam would have height H, and we'll call it width B. So what we're going to look at, let's have a look at a an elemental height through here, okay, and the, and the cross-section cut through here. So we're looking at what's going on in this section. And we would have an applied shear force being applied, which we'll, give, we'll call V, because that's what we call shear forces. And shear force through the university, the university distributed load, where we've got here. So I've picked a point that's not the very center, okay? I've picked a point that's somewhere else that's got that actual shear force occurring. So if we then take this element and we now look at it from the side, Now, some section through the beam, I'm going to have my shear force due to the application, which we'll call tau. And then to keep this element in equilibrium, to stop this element from turning around, this shear force being applied would cause it to want to go this way. We then have a reaction shear force. These are called the complementary shear forces. These are what maintain the element and thereby the beam in full equilibrium. And so I also have to have these two to stop the beam from the element from rotating. And we call these reactions the complementary shear forces on the element. Okay, they're what stop the actual element from just moving with this shear force. So this one sort of makes sense because it's got to have something stopping the beam from shearing. These upper two tend to be less intuitive and we tend not to think about them quite so easily why they occur. But let's just consider two examples. If I've got... Let's draw one really big beam. 
and then one half thickness beam with another half thickness beam on top of it. And if I had these two examples and I applied to both of them the same shear force, let's say apply it to somehow apply it to these two together. If I applied the same shear force, then this first one, again, not drawing any of these to scale or even any hope of scale. Then we'd see deflection in this beam. This second one though, what we would end up seeing is a greater deflection, assuming all the other material properties are the same. And that's simply because there's no ability to withstand those horizontal shear forces between the beam. That's a terrible diagram I've just drawn. I know there's a good example of this in my company notes. So have a look at those if you're a little bit unclear. But it is this inability to withstand the complementary shear forces due to this applied shear force that means this double beam is less able to withstand bending. Okay, and I always try and read it when I write something because I know my handwriting's terrible. But so it's the lack of ability to withstand the horizontal complementary shear force causes a greater deflection. So that I just put up here because it helps us understand where these sort of complementary shear forces come from and you know why they actually why we care about them. And so clearly these internal shear forces and these including what well, these complementary ones here. These are the means through which a solid structure transmits any applied loads back to its reaction forces. Because again, with this applied here, we would just see, um, if I just call this, if instead of single shear force being applied, we'd have a V on two and a V on two being applied here. So we would see those internal and those complementary shear forces are the means through which this V gets transmitted and dissipated to the structure, sorry, to the supports. So if these internal forces are how a structure resists an applied load, then they're going to be important for helping us understand the shear center for reasons that we'll show. Internal forces are how a structure resists load and transmits applied forces to the reaction. So we're going to use the formula for shear, sorry, the formula for shear stress to help us develop something that's going to look at how this shear force gets propagated internally within a structure. Okay, so tau is equal to shear force multiplied by the first moment of area divided by the second moment of area divided by t. Okay, t is the thickness in this case. So let's just talk about everything in here. So V is, yep, applied shear force that we apply. This one here, first moment of area. Okay, so we might need a bit of revision on where this comes from, what it means. 
So we're going to use this to help us develop means to look at how shear is propagated through a structure. V is shear force. Q, first moment of area. This is then a function of wherever you are within our structure. I is just a number. It's going to be a constant for a section based upon the distribution of mass. So based upon the distribution of area around a centroid. And T is just the thickness of our section. So again, this is from just from the definition of shear force, which should be revision from last year. First moment of area is... Q is equal to the area of an object multiplied by the distance from its centroid to the centroid of the object in general. So for a simple object like an I-beam, we can work out the first moment of area of the, of the, of the different rectangles that make up an I-beam, and we can then work out the first moment of area. And I'll include some examples for that um, in the accompanying notes as well. So... Because most of, our, most of our objects are going to be thin walls, and we've said that, we're looking at thin wall structures, we're going to assume there's no variation of shear stress within the thickness of a section. So we're going to define shear flow Q. We're going to say that Q is equal to shear stress multiplied by the thickness. So it's therefore going to be equal to V Q on I. Okay, so I think that that's probably a good point to leave this at for this moment. So we've introduced what this idea of shear flow is, spoken about what it is, and I've given you this, this sort of top level idea of what shear flow is. And then we're going to move into some examples into the next lecture of how we're actually going to use this, define it, and calculate it separately for closed and open sections. Okay, so let's just go back through what we went over today. Really, we're just more talk about shear center. Talking about shear center and why it's important. Um, we've said here that for symmetric sections, objects with two axes of symmetry, then the shear center is the centroid. If we've got an object with one axis of symmetry, then the shear center lies somewhere on the axis of symmetry, but we don't know. We've then said that based upon what we know about aircraft wings, they are effectively thin walled structures because even though we've got spars, ribs, skin, those themselves comprise thin walls. So the web and the flange of a spar, for example, are thin, the skin is thin. That means that we can approximate behavior with these sort of thin walled sections here. And then so we're going to go through and we're going to try and come up with means that are going to help us determine the things that go into understanding how they deflect. So shear stresses, we know how they look in, in beams, subject to both point loads, uniformly just distributed loads again. And we've now said that there's obviously some means of internal complementary shear stresses that stop the beam from deforming under the load. Or maintain, sorry, not necessarily stop it from deforming. They maintain equilibrium, stop acceleration on the object. Um, and then we introduced this idea of shear flow. We've just said that our sections are 
thin walls, so we don't particularly care about the distribution between the, in the thickness. And we've introduced this idea called shear flow here. And this is probably still all quite, doesn't make any sense yet, we're just thinking about it. But it's a good chance to take a break and then we're going to come back and look at calculation of shear flow within different sorts of sections. Okay, um, I'm going to record that now anyway, but I'll release these probably a day or so apart. Okay, take care guys, I'll see you 